very pleased to be here to tell you about what makes Groovy, Groovy. So Groovy with an uppercase, the Groovy programming language, and Groovy, the adjective. A few words about me. I'm Guillaume Laforge. I'm the lead of the Groovy project. I've been working on the Groovy project for the past, almost the past 10 years. And I've been leading the project uh, for, well, the past eight years or so. Um, so there are a few links if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, etc. And I'm working for Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal is the spin-off from VMware, EMC, Spring Source, etc., where we put uh, a lot of the a lot of interesting projects and products into uh, the same box. So all the things around Spring, all the things around Groovy and Grails. Uh, some data fabrics, messaging fabric, uh, big data, all the stuff around cloud with Cloud Foundry, etc. We put everything in, a, in the same box, and that's what Pivotal is, right? And I put Groovy on the top because you know, <laughs> that's the, the star in the sky there. So this talk is um, separated into uh, different sections. First, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about the Groovy vision, the, the goal uh, behind Groovy. The goal, the main goal for Groovy has always been to simplify the life of developers and particularly the life of Java developers. When I say Java developers, that's because even in terms of syntax, uh, Groovy can be seen as a kind of Java superset because the syntax of the language uh, derives from uh, the, the, the Java grammar, basically. That's why it makes it um, pretty easy to learn because uh, Java developers already feel at ease with the language. And beyond the syntax, the grammar, etc., uh, we created lots of interesting tools, APIs, wrapper around uh, JDK, APIs or uh, libraries uh, to make things easier. So you'll find things like a template engine, you'll find things like uh, a builder concept to build UIs in Swing, etc. You'll find uh, interesting things uh, that make you more productive when you want to use those uh, APIs from the JDK or, or elsewhere. Because what we want is to get things done, right? So that's a language made by pragmatic people for pragmatic people. We are not language theorists or anything like that. We're just trying to get things done. And we also have a certain taste and we like things which are elegant. Perhaps some of you have been to the uh, talk by um, Ken earlier, uh, just, just before that uh, se session about the, the spot testing framework. And uh, it's one example of pretty readable code uh, where, well, I'll come back to that example at the, at the end of the presentation, uh, where you can see uh, you know, things like data tables to feed expectations in a test case. That's quite readable and powerful. And although Groovy is a dynamic language, sometimes people think that dynamic languages are slow or uh, dynamic languages are not as safe as statically typed languages. Uh, Groovy also beyond its dynamic capabilities, also add things like static type checking in order to make the code as type safe uh, as you need it to be. And for the hot spots in your application where perhaps Groovy might not be as fast, you can also use static compilation to generate the same kind of bytecode as the Java C compiler to have code as fast as Java. So forget about that bad image of uh, dynamic languages being slow, that's just not true or not safe uh, because Groovy is both, uh, both as safe and fast as needed. And it's pretty, um, let's say, flexible. Thanks to its dynamic nature, we can write things like that where we use closures and nested method calls to create data structures, hierarchical data structures. That's our markup builder, which generates some uh, XML, HTML uh, markup. And uh, a, big use case, a big use case for Groovy is uh, for business rules, domain-specific languages, etc. This, this is the kind of sentence which, beyond the Java syntax, which is supported by Groovy, uh, makes Groovy able uh, to uh, write 
kind of plain English sentences. So this is a valid uh, statement uh, in Groovy. And it's also a way to, um, I mean, the beyond Java, which is usually pretty verbose, we can uh, make the code pretty uh, concise. And for example, with the Spring Boot uh, project, part of the, the new uh, Spring uh, framework for uh, release, uh, we are now able, thanks to Groovy, if you use Groovy, obviously, uh, to write a full-blown Spring application in the span of a tweet. So if I put the, the example here more, more clearly, um, with the Spring uh, command line interface in Spring Boot, you can just put that into a, a Groovy file, and then you use the Spring command, it's going to execute a Hello World kind of web application. So it's pretty concise, and uh, Groovy allows you, thanks to things like AST transformations and some advanced features, allows you uh, to do uh, some concise stuff. Groovy is also a pretty successful project, downloaded, uh, well, uh, 1.7 million times a year across all versions. Um, <clears throat> there are different use cases for Groovy, like scripting, if you've got some automation tasks, or if you want to write domain-specific languages, like I mentioned before, or also you can integrate uh, Groovy in a Java application. You can mix and match Groovy and Java together pretty easily. So these are some of the key use cases for Groovy. And, I mean, some companies do agree with the fact that Groovy is useful and ready, you know, for production and so on. Otherwise, we wouldn't get uh, one or two million downloads a year. And these guys, all those guys are actually Groovy users in a way or another. For example, Google in the middle, that's not direct Groovy users, but that's through the, um, the Gradle build uh, solution. Uh, which is being used for building Android applications, and it's using Groovy as the DSL for uh, the build automation. Okay, now the cool Groovy gems, um, the nice things I like about Groovy. So I'm not necessarily going to go deep into things like all the metaprogramming, dynamic metaprogramming features, or I won't necessarily go uh, very far in the very latest features that we've been added to, you know, the latest versions. But I want to highlight some of the, well, the cool features that I like about the language. Um, and we'll first start with um, some, well, to get you started with uh, Groovy, uh, a little uh, Groovy primer when you come from a Java background. So most Java code is also valid Groovy code because of the fact that the Groovy syntax uh, derives from the, the Java grammar, which means that Potentially, any Java developer is actually already a Groovy developer without really knowing it. That's why you have a flat learning curve and it's easy to learn. Groovy is less verbose than Java. When you want to do something like a simple, you know, hello uh, on the, you know, on the command line, or on the uh, in the console, sorry. Uh, if you just want to print hello, there's quite a bit of boilerplate code like public class public static void main string args, etc., which is pretty verbose. Uh, in Groovy, you can have scripts, which is just a free uh, standing list of uh, statements. And there are even some shortcuts like println, which calls system out println. Okay, so this is a first difference. But beyond Java, there are many things which are optional, like semicolons, you can uh, drop them. Parentheses, you can drop them in some uh, under certain conditions. Uh, you can omit the written keyword, public keyword, and you can even use what we call optional typing, uh, the fact of uh, not necessarily defining the type of your uh, variables, etc. And let's start to illustrate that with a greeter uh, pojo. So this is a, a, a Java class, a Java bean where you have, uh, so there's a class, you have a property called owner with a getter and a setter, the usual you know, getter and setter implementation, and you also have a greet method, which takes a parameter, and then you return some string. Later on, in, let's say in the main method, you'd have a way of uh, instantiating uh, that, that, uh, an, an object of that class. You set the, the owner, 
and then you just print the output of this um, grid method, okay? So I mentioned there are things which are optional. Let's get rid of the stuff which is optional. First of all, semicolons. You remove the semicolons, it's still valid GUI code. It's not Java code anymore, obviously, you'd get compilation errors, but this is still uh, valid GUI code because semicolons are optional. What else? <clears throat> parentheses, you can remove some of the parentheses here and there. For example, here, set owner, I, I remove the parents there, as well as here uh, for the print line call. But I can't remove them all because otherwise it's difficult to parse and figure out uh, what is a parameter of what, etc. So I just remove those ones. The return keyword, the last expression of a method, of a non-void method, uh, is what is being returned by default. You can be explicit and still use return, obviously, but if you want, you can just get rid of that return here as well as there for the, um, the getter. And it's going to return owner and then hello name, I'm owner. The public keyword by default, uh, you want to have classes which are usable, so you want to be able to instantiate them, so you don't want you might need private classes, but you don't necessarily, uh, I mean, by default, you usually write public classes. Same for methods, you want to create APIs, so you have methods which are uh, being used outside of the context of that specific class. So by default, uh, we said that uh, methods and classes are public. If you want things to be private, be explicit, and use the private modifier. Uh, what else? Optional typing, uh, you can say def greeter instead of greeter, greeter equals new greeter, which is, you know, repeating yourself to really be sure that it's a greeter class, a greeter object. And uh, yeah, a little remark as well is, um, you could also put def, uh, let's say here, def get owner or greet def name and that kind of things, but I'm usually against that because uh, methods are like contracts and you want to retain uh, the signature, uh, properly typed signature, so that, uh, for example, your ID knows what type to expect as parameters, as return type, uh, to help you with code completion and also have tools like Javadoc or GroovyDoc figure out uh, the type of things that you're working with. So it's usually better to keep types for things like contracts and for things like, well, uh, local variables, uh, you can just say def and it's totally fine. We have, as we saw in the, the previous slide, we have a shortcut for println. So instead of system out println, you just say println. And uh, yeah, the properties. Getters and setters usually have the same implementation unless you want to do things like you know, lazy, uh, lazy loading of some collection or something like that. But otherwise, this is the usual getter and setter for, for a property. So following the, the same approach with public class, public methods, etc., uh, we figured that, okay, if you don't specify a modifier here, by default, we consider that this special field here is considered to be a property and the compiler will auto-generate for you the getter and the setter. So you can just remove the getter and the setter. If you want to have a special getter or setter which might be doing lazy initialization and things like that, you can still override them, you can still, still write them. That's not a problem. But by default, if it's just a plain usual uh, property, you just say a string owner. Okay, and you can use the property notation instead of saying set owner. You can just set dot owner equals. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm missing the uh, equals here. Let's fix the slides. Where am I? I can fix it. Well, never mind because I, I'd have to fix it on several slides. Uh, so I forgot the equal sign here between the two. And you can also, although the class doesn't have a specific uh, constructor for greeter, you can also say greeter, owner, colon, Guillaume. It's actually going to call the default constructor and then in turn is going to call the setter. So it's, going, it's equivalent to new greeter and then owner equals uh, Guillaume. But here you can pass this named argument to the constructor 
and Groovy will figure out and call the setter afterwards. Okay, we are close to, oh yeah, one last thing, that's interpolated strings that we call, well, a sexy feature, a G-string. Um, so instead of doing concatenation, you know, string plus a variable plus a string, etc., we just have that kind of notation with the, uh, the dollar signs. And uh, it's going to, you know, it's a placeholder, and when you're going to evaluate that G-string into a string, uh, we're going to replace name with the name parameter. We're going to replace owner with the owner, the value of the, proper, the, the owner property. And I think we did all that we could do there to make, to transform, well, Java code, which was valid Groovy code, to, to transform Java code into Groovy code. So if we reformat things a little bit, here's what we have in the end. Instead of, yeah, twice as many lines uh, of boilerplate code in Java, um, short with a nice shortcut here with just like one, two, three, four, or five, yeah, six lines instead of 11 or 12. So this is the more idiomatic way of writing Groovy code, obviously. But, um, you know, from experience, um, Java teams adopting Groovy often write Java code in Groovy, basically, and progressively learn the new tricks and progressively uh, write more idiomatic code like that. So we've got native syntax constructs for various things. Let's go uh, into these ones, closures. So closures are basically our first class uh, citizens for functions. So Groovy can do lots of uh, functional stuff, functional programming style. And this is what a closure looks like. So this is a, a, a block of code delimit, 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 oh, surrounded by <laughs> curly braces. Uh, you can pass parameters A and B, uh, and you somehow inject, you know, with that arrow there, uh, inject those parameters into the body of uh, the closure. You can also assign that uh, into a variable. Uh, and then uh, um, here um, you can use, you know, the, uh, well, method syntax, me method call syntax, I would say. Uh, so you say adder and parents, and you pass the parameters. Uh, but those closures are actually real objects, real instance of the closure class. And uh, this notation is actually somehow a shortcut for the call method that is part of the closure contract. What's interesting here, I didn't specify the types for the parameters of my closure. And what's interesting is that uh, it makes somehow the, the code of that closure more, more generic in the sense that uh, it adds things uh, which have a plus operator, right? So you have a plus operator for numbers, but Groovy also adds plus for strings, like in, in Java, so you can use that same closure to add numbers or to add strings together, to concatenate strings together. If we wanted to specify the types, this is how you would do. So instead of a comma b, you say int a comma int b. Uh, by default, Closures have one implicit parameter. Uh, if you don't specify its name or uh, its type, etc., it's it. So it times two. Uh, it's like if I had written uh, it arrow and then it times two. So this is a, somehow a shortcut. It's an implicit uh, parameter. So you can say double three up equals six, etc. And there's also again a, um, an operator of learning there uh, for uh, which doesn't exist in Java, which is uh, the multiply sign. Uh, you can multiply a string by a number, and it's going to repeat that string that number of times. So that's why a times two is going to write a a. Implicit parameter and multiply on strings. You can have variable number of arguments. Um, so, yeah, that's it. And you can say int triple dots if you want to specify the types of those uh, elements. So it's just like the var args uh, in Java. So here I have a little shortcut because there's already a sum method which exists on arrays, uh, collections, etc. Uh, it was for the purpose of showing variable arguments. So we can call that closure with two, three, four arguments. The, um, the, the, the arguments uh, can have default values. 
So int a int b equal 10. So if you pass the two arguments, 2 and 3, it's going to put 2 in a and 3 in b. But if you don't pass the second parameter, if you just pass one parameter, uh, b will have uh, 10 in it. So 5 times 10 equals 50. <clears throat> and a little thing which is which, which can be pretty handy um, is you can get a function, uh, kind of a, well, let's say a pointer of our, or a method. Let's say I want to reuse and pass uh, the log 10 uh, method from uh, Java Long Math, uh, or uh, retrieve the println method from system out. Uh, I can do that with that syntax dot ampersand. And I can say, okay, log base 10, uh, of 10 equals 1, and this is my, uh, you know, synonym or uh, my own function name and printer. And I think I've got another example afterwards using it. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, so it's useful if you want to pass around some methods, uh, some function, actually, which, is, uh, which was actually implemented as a method on some existing type. Uh, with closures and collections and lists, uh, you can do uh, the usual map filter reduce kind of stuff that you will be seeing in Java 8 and the stream uh, API. But, well, it's been there uh, in GUI for years and years. Um, so you have a person class uh, with two properties, and uh, I'm going to make it immutable, but I'll come back to that later on. I've got a collection, I've got a list of persons, and then I want to be able to find all the persons below 18. I want to retrieve their names and put them in uppercase to sort them and then to join all the names together to have a, a, resulting, a resulting string. So find all is our uh, filter, basically, uh, filter method. Collect is our map operation. And then, um, well, sort is uh, sorting stuff and join is our reduce operation. And then I can assert that, uh, well, the result of that uh, is this string, okay? And I show find all collect, sort, join, but there are many other useful methods uh, like uh, group by, to group things together, uh, to do some permutations, to count by certain, uh, by a closure criteria, etc. Many useful methods to slice and dice uh, collections, etc. And closures are also used for resource handling. So instead of um, you know, doing try-catch blocks and finally blocks where you close resources and that kind of things, uh, Groovy is able to add dynamically uh, new methods to existing types like the Java IO classes. So there's a with reader method that we added to a uh, Java IO file. And it takes a closure, and the, the parameter of that closure is the reader. And once the call of that closure is over, we actually do uh, the cleanup afterwards. So we close properly uh, the file on the underlying uh, input stream and reader. And I'm going to create also a file with a writer and let's say for each line, I want to check uh, and find all the lines which contain uh, a certain word. And if that word is there, I'm going to uh, output in the writer uh, the uppercase uh, version of that line. So see how we um, nest somehow closures. So the surrounding one with the reader, the inner one with the, the writer, and also one over the, the reader, so that you iterate over each line of that reader, etc. So this is pretty elegant, and you won't uh, you know, be having bugs in the way you handle uh, your resources, because that's done by uh, Java, it's, uh, by Groovy, sorry, by Groovy itself, by the GDK, the Groovy Development Kit. Up. Another area where closures are useful, you can, uh, especially for domain-specific languages, you can create your own uh, custom control structures. So if you have a, a method which looks like that with some Boolean condition and uh, the key uh, aspect is to have the closure as the last parameter, you're able to call that method 
uh, a bit like you would with an, with an if statement, okay? So here I'm creating somehow the opposite of the if statement with unless. Um, so it takes a condition, a Boolean condition, uh, which is this condition, and the closure being the last parameter of that method, you can put it outside of the parents. This is actually equivalent to calling it that way, unless Boolean, comma, the closure. But it's a syntactical rule that allows me to put the closure outside. And if you look at it, it just looks like uh, an if statement, right? So you can create your own uh, custom uh, control structures, which is pretty powerful. Well, we already saw an example of lists, so lists, that's just uh, square brackets and uh, comma separated list of things. And I already uh, showed you some of the examples, find all, collect, etc. Inject is a way of doing uh, reduce operations. This is the, the reduction that's happening, so I'm concatenating everything together. Uh, also, this one is uh, the left shift operator, as we call it. Uh, you saw it also on the previous slide where uh, it was used to, a bit like in C++, by the way, where you can um, append stuff to a file, or here it's appending some value to uh, this mutable list. Okay, and it's done by operator overloading, and you can also overload the, those operators yourself. It's just a, a, a convention, a naming convention. As long as you have a method called left shift, uh, it's equivalent to that operator. For maps, it looks like a uh, list, except that it's colon, uh, um, key colon uh, value. And you can use uh, this indexed, uh, you know, like you would access uh, um, yeah, an element of a list, but it's uh, an element, uh, it's the key of, the, of that map, or you can use that property notation. So you can, both are equivalent, actually, map daughters or map square brackets, string daughters. Uh, that's uh, the same thing. We have regular expressions. So this is uh, here creating a, a pattern, a Java, uh, what is it, Java util regex pattern? I never remember the package in Java. So this is a Java pattern. Here we create a, a match, uh, a matcher, actually. Uh, notice, uh, you know, the TLD sign, and there the, the this uh, this is actually a, a, a no, the notation for strings with groovy slashy strings. Uh, what's nice, although I don't I don't show that that in in that string, is that you don't have to double escape backslashes and things like that. So for for um, regular expressions, that's uh, pretty handy. Um, we also have the find operator, uh, actually it's the reverse. That's this one which is fine, and this one which creates a matcher, that's creating a matcher. And the one I particularly like is this one where, let's say you pass a string, you, you have a string, and you want to retrieve the zip code here and uh, the name of the town. So it follows that pattern. So it's uh, five, you know, five digits, some white space, and uh, a word. And uh, you pass a closure. The match is actually the whole string, basically. And you get the zip code, which is the first group uh, identified by the, uh, the parents. And the second group, which is here, uh, which is the name of the town. So you can easily extract things uh, from a string according to a certain regular expression, which is pretty handy and powerful. We, uh, last uh, element of uh, particular um, you know, native syntax constructs, that's ranges. So notice the, uh, the double dot. So this is a range. You also have ranges with exclu excluded upper bounds. That's uh, where you see the inferior sign here. You can do reverse ranges, so from 10 to zero instead of zero to 10. And something, it's not just about ranges, you can also use that in lists. Uh, you can define negative index for uh, the index that you pass to uh, that list or array, etc. And it finds the last element. If you say minus two, it's going to find the previous one, uh, etc. So you can go backwards uh, from the end. And you could even go, you know, have, well, no, you could, uh, you know, have a reverse range and go <laughs> from the end, which goes from 
uh, like a, a non-reverse range. Well, anyway, so don't mix things up because you might be uh, going into the, the wrong direction somehow. <clears throat> and strings, uh, so you already saw G strings. Here we have a plain Java long string. There's no interpolation going on. And when you use single uh, quotes, it's always a plain Java long string. If you use double quotes or slashy strings, it can be a G string with interpolation. And uh, I explain, uh, so um, the, you know, the name placeholder will be replaced by Groovy. Now, yeah, some interactivity with the audience might be nice just to see if you're not sleeping. What happens when you do something like that in Java? 2.0 minus uh, 1.1. What's the result? It's inaccurate, yes. So um, instead of 0 0.9, it's 0 0.899999. So it can be you know, confusing for let's say um, actuaries in a, an insurance company or uh, traders or in a, in a bank. Um, so why is it like that? Another example is this one. Three divided by two. So what's the result in Java? It's, well, yeah, I heard it. It's one. So it's one because we do uh, integer divisions and uh, the result is int, so it's one, and it's not 1.5 or 1.49, whatever. It's not 1.5, so it can be pretty confusing. So Groovy decided, uh, you know, with a financial crisis, uh, and if you have rounding errors, perhaps it's not really important anymore, anymore to have uh, uh, rounding errors for, uh, you know, representing millions of uh, pounds or euros. But I think it's still important for financial applications to, to have accurate calculations. When you do 2.0 minus 1.1 in Groovy, that's 0 0.9. If you do 3 divided by 2, it's 1.5. Because Groovy decided to use big decimal by default, which is what we should be using in uh, you know, finance and that kind of stuff. An interesting effect is that Sometimes I see micro benchmarks on the web saying, wow, Groovy is so slow when you do numerical operations. Yes, you just did know that we used big decimal in instead of floats or doubles. So it can be surprising sometimes in terms of results. But if you really want to use floats and doubles, uh, you can say uh, uh, float f equals 0 0.9, or you can say 0 0.9 f or 0.9d for defining doubles. So you can still use floats and doubles. So that's one of the little differences between Java and Groovy, uh, where both languages differ. Um, but that's what made Groovy be adopted by uh, financial institutions, like the ones you saw in the big slides with all those names, uh, company names. And some companies decided to use Groovy even almost, well, not just for that feature, but that, that feature of using big decimal by default was really a key element of using group, of deciding to use group. Some steroids, uh, powerful switch case statements. So uh, since uh, that's uh, Java 6 or 7, no, uh, Java 7, uh, you can use things like strings in switch statements beside just you know numeric types like uh, ints. Uh, but in Groovy, we can use more than just uh, things like ints, bytes, and so on, and strings. You can use them, obviously, numbers, uh, strings, but you can also say type, a given type. So it's going to check that object is instance of string, or you can check that object is in that list, or that string, if it's a string here, match, matches a certain uh, regular expressions, or you can also have a custom condition, a custom criteria in the form of a closure. So it's pretty powerful, and sometimes you can use that as a palliative of um, uh, pattern matching, basically, with this uh, advanced switch case. So it's the same structure as Java switch case, but we go a bit beyond because we support different kinds of uh, values here for the case statements. <clears throat> named arguments. So you saw an example of named arguments already uh, with the named uh, argument constructor. 
move obj x3, y4. Here we mix normal arguments. Obj is a normal argument. And you have x and y, which are named arguments. Um, this method call, and especially you also see that, you know, I drop the parents around that. This is actually going to call this method, move map, uh, the Java method, if you will, the, the signature of the me method which is being called uh, will be something like that. Object, you know, it might be uh, typed, not necessarily object, but uh, uh, all the named arguments are actually going to be put somehow in a map. So this map is going to contain two keys, x and y, and the, the associated value three and four. And then all the other uh, na uh, normal arguments, uh, even if they appear there, there, etc., appear after uh, the, the, the map argument here. So this is what allows you sometimes to make nice DSLs. And I have a, an example. Uh, yeah, I'll combine that with that uh, example there in the next slide. Let me explicit that one first. Uh, I mentioned that example in introduction already. So you can create some very readable, you know, English sentences uh, in Groovy. What we call command chains is this ability to chain method calls, but uh, without, dots, without dots and parents. So this call is actually equivalent to move forward. It's going to return some result on which you're going to call a method called at. And at takes some uh, value, three dot kilometer per hour. And the trick here is that we can add properties to numbers in Groovy dynamically. So you can say, uh, three dot km is actually a shortcut for three dot get km. Okay. Then with me method of loading, uh, operator of loading. Sorry, uh, the the division sign here is the div method, and then h is some you know duration constant that's coming from elsewhere. So this sentence here is actually equivalent to that sentence. So that's what command chains are about: a way of dropping parents and dots to make uh, more, you know, complex English sentences. And now you can combine named arguments and common chains together. And you are able to write something like that. Check that. Vodka tastes good. And the interesting thing is, uh, visually, you have the impression that the separation is made with the colon. Check that. Vodka tastes good. But if you look at how it's parsed and the convention uh, in terms of the, the method which is being called, it's check that vodka, that vodka is a named argument. It's returning something. And then dot tastes good, which is a call on the return value of that check call. That's pretty, pretty funny <laughs> and powerful. <clears throat> multiple assignments. Groovy can do multiple assignments. So instead of doing def A equals string A, def B equals string B, you can use those parents here. Uh, to say, okay, I want to define both variables together, and uh, A is going to be put into A and B into B, obviously. Here is how you would do a swap, uh, A and B, and then, uh, so this is the syntax of a list, obviously. Uh, B and A, and it's going to, you know, do the temporary variable stuff to uh, avoid stepping on each stores. And uh, A is going to contain the value of B and uh, etc. You can specify types as well if you do multiple assignment, int i, int j. Um, if you have a method which returns a list, you can get uh, the, the, those two uh, values uh, using multiple assignments. So you can say geocode Paris. So you want to uh, have the coordinates of, of Paris. And the latitude is going to be that one, and the longitude is going to be that one. So that's what the assert shows. But you can do that destructuring, that what we call, uh, on your own types. So it's not just with lists. As long as you have a type, and again, it's a convention um, that is provided by Groovy. If you have a method called getAt, which takes some index, uh, Groovy will be able to do the destructuring with the multiple assignment. So here I define a new point with those coordinates. And then, although on the you know, right-hand side you see something which is an instance of point, on the left-hand side you see two variables 
which are actually just doubles there. And it's destructuring, you know, that value is going to be put in the X variable and that one into the Y variable. That's what the assert shows. That's the convention. I showed in introduction an example of the markup builder. Um, this is uh, the JSON builder here. Um, anything that is hierarchically, you know, hierarchical data, tree structure data, uh, can be represented with uh, Groovy's concept of builders, which is a way of uh, nesting closures together to define the, you know, the different levels of uh, nesting. So you have a, you create a person with those uh, attributes, and you have a sub JSON object address with those properties. So this is going to generate that kind of JSON content. All right, and you see again, you know the the well, it's not closures, it's uh, JavaScript objects, but you see curly braces here and here as well, okay? So if I just come back there, you see the same level of nesting uh, with the, the curly braces. You can uh, create JSON, but you can also uh, consume JSON payloads. Let's say I'm going to fetch the list of commits uh, on the GitHub repository of the Guri project. So this is the mouthful long URL of uh, the, um, the REST API uh, from GitHub. And you, ha you have a, a slurper. Uh, we have some, the same thing for XML, et cetera. So you have an XML slurper, a JSON slurper, et cetera, uh, which is able to parse uh, the, the JSON content uh, which is there. So I'm going to parse. Also here, notice that nice shortcut. So this is a string URL. You transform that into a proper java.net URL with this uh, method added by Groovy. And you can call dot text, which is equivalent to get text method, uh, which is going to uh, open a stream uh, at that URL, uh, fetch the content, close the stream, etc., properly for you. So in you know just a few words uh, uh, with just dot text, you're able to retrieve, you know, to do a basically an HTTP get. Uh, it, with just calling dot text, that's quite neat. And uh, this is going to return the JSON payload. And you don't have to do any kind of marshalling or anything like that. Uh, you just say commits. I want to retrieve the first commit of the list of commits. Then I retrieve the commit object. Then I retrieve the author object, which is an attribute on that commit object here. And then author dot name, etc. So I don't have to you know, create the intermediary data structure uh, by convention somehow with the, the, the dynamic features of Groovy. I'm able to call that if I already had, like if I already had a, a graph of objects representing that JSON content. So I can just say, okay, commit zero dot commit, author name, etc. That's what we call GPath expressions. And you can also mix in things like find, find all, collect, inject, join, etc. Into the mix uh, to create more complex expressions. So it's a bit like XPath, but for object graphs. It works here on JSON. It works on XML and uh, any pretty much anything you could think of that is uh, hierarchical. Yeah, this one um, power asserts. So in Java you also have asserts, but they are disabled by default, which uh, doesn't make them very useful. Uh, in Groovy, asserts are not disabled by default. So I have three variables, and I want to assert that the, the, the two expressions uh, on the left and right side of the double equal are equals. So I've put total random expressions, and I know that the, this assertion is going to fail. And what's going to happen is it go, it's going to fail with that message there, A. Well, what's interesting is, and that's what we call that power assert, is that you see all the, the, the values of the sub-expressions of both sides of the equals. So pretty easily you can see where you may have made a, a mistake uh, in, in your uh, expressions. So it's pretty visual, and you'd have, you don't have to do you know, several asserts to check the, varial, the, 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 the various sub-expressions. You just have one big assert, and you can have a, a view of the values of each sub-expressions. And that's been... Uh, 
coming from the Spoc test framework uh, that contributed that back to Groovy. Now, null handling. Let's say you have a graph of object order, which got a line item, which got a quantity of items, etc. And an item can have a name. So I'm creating this order here, uh, an order with a line item. Uh, but the line item, the item is actually null. What happens if you do o.line.item.name in Java? You're going, you're going to get a null pointer exception because item is null, so you cannot call dot .name on null. But the, the NP you get is just null pointer exception on line uh, 10. It's not telling you what is null, what's going on here. If you do that in Groovy, it's going to tell you cannot get property name on null object. It's way more descriptive, and you know what was null. That's pretty handy. And if you uh, want to be safe and you know that there might be something which is null in that long chain, you could also write that that way with the, the, the question mark. Question mark dot, question mark dot. Or you could have some dots and question mark dots. And it's going to generate on null if something in the chain is null. So you don't have to make, you know, nested if line is not null, then if line dot item is not null, then etc. So you can just say all line item name, and it's null if something is null in the chain. So after null, let's speak up. Let's let's speak about the truth, the Groovy truth, a bit like JavaScript uh, falsiness and truthiness, and also um, how you can customize the truth if you're you know a lawyer or something like that. That could be handy. I'll show you what it means. So the Groovy truth. It's not just about Booleans being true or false, but all the things can be true or false. Null is false. An empty string is false. An empty list or map or any collection or an iterator without a uh, next uh, element is false. Can be coerced to the value of false if you pass that expression to an if, a, uh, yeah, a while, an assert, etc. Anything that expects a, um, a Boolean, if you pass something which is not a Boolean, we're going to try to coerce that value into a Boolean expression, a Boolean value. Anything that's not zero, uh, well, zero is false, and uh, every, every number that's non-zero is true. So here, a non-null object is true, a string, a non-empty string is true, a non-empty list is true, a non-zero number is true. So what's not false is obviously true otherwise. And now, let's say you want to be able um, <clears throat> to say uh, if account, if, the, if an account is not disabled, then I, I, um, I want to do something. So you, you could say if account dot uh, is disabled or something like that. But there's uh, this convention again in Groovy. If you have a as boolean method, which is defined, you can say, while account, if account, and it's going to coerce the account uh, into a Boolean value, and it's going to use here the, the disabled property uh, for that purpose. So, well, that's how you can customize the truth. You could imagine, you know, a predicate class, if you have a, a notion of predicate, which might be true or false, composed predicates, etc. a bit like in the Guava library, for example. Uh, so you could add an as boolean method to a Guava's predicate class and have it being used just like a, a proper boolean expression. So that's how you can customize the truth. And now let me tell you something about Elvis. So you know, Groovy has got a Groovy name. Uh, we've got the G string, you know, G string string, and we, we have the, the Elvis operator. So we can be pretty fancy at times. So what is the Elvis operator? So let's say you have two strings, like x and y, and you want to, to, um, um, to have a default value if something is null or empty or, or anything like that. So if you want to return, uh, let's say, MacBook Pro, if that variable x uh, contains something useful, or if, it's, if x contains null, you, you'd want to return unknown, OK? So in pure Java, you'd do something like that. OK, if x, the string is not null, if the size is not uh, 0, uh, if it's not empty, then x, otherwise, you return unknown, you return y. With the Groovy truth, 
you remember that uh, what's not null uh, is true. So you could write, write it like that. But also what uh, has got a positive size is true. So you can just say if x, then x, else y. If you go a bit further, you could also have used uh, the ternary operator. If x, then x, else y. OK? But there's a little bit of repetition. You have x and x. So we created kind of a you know, contraction. You remove the, the x in the middle, and uh, you just have the question mark and the colon. And that's the Elvis operator. Did you guess why it's called Elvis, by the, by the way? Any idea? So it's a bit like the smiley, if you, oh, if you do like that. It looks like uh, the Elvis smiley. That's, uh, that's where it's coming from. Uh, yeah, I don't have much time left. In Groovy, we have what we call AST transformation. It's a bit like macros, where you transform the structure of your program before it's compiled to bytecode. We have lots of ND AST transformations, and I won't list them all, but I'll just mention uh, a few ones. You already saw it in one of my slides. Immutability. If you want to implement immutability for your classes, uh, if you do it by the book, you have to have final classes, private final back, backing fields, you do defensive copying of collections if there are properties, etc. cetera. It, it can be error prone if you have to do that work yourself. It would look something like that in Java, but it's a bit verbose if you want to implement immutability, uh, to implement a proper equals, etc. But all you really wanted was a, a, you know, a person class with a name property and an age property. OK, it's verbose. It's valid Groovy code, obviously, but we can do better because we have a at immutable annotation which triggers the transformation of that class into an immutable object. So instead of that long, long Java class, you can just say at immutable, and it's, go it's going to transform that class into an immutable one. Some other interesting transformations, for example, memoization. Um, if you want to cache the value of previous invocations of closures or methods, etc., especially side effect free methods or functions because you want to cache the results for a, a given set of values. Um, typically, Fibonacci, you're going to always return the same value for the same value of n. So if you say, and, and the problem with that uh, method is that, well, Fibonacci 40 will work, but if you do Fibonacci 1000 or more, uh, you may have some stack overflow, etc. cetera, uh, because there, there's tons of, uh, calls going on uh, recursively. With AddMemoize, it's going to create some kind of uh, uh, cache, which is going to cache the values of, of those things. And uh, instead of, instead of uh, calling Fibonacci way too many times, it's just going to retrieve the result from the cache, avoiding uh, the recursion uh, for the sub-values, you know, five, Fib 6, then 5, then 4, then 3, etc. So AST transformations are nice because they allow you to be lazy. You can let the compiler do the job for you and implement uh, those things for you without you know, making error-prone code yourself because that's the, the transformation which does the heavy lifting. It makes code more concise and readable and obviously more easily maintainable because, uh, well, it's not your code, it's someone else's code. So the Groovy team have uh, to, uh, has to maintain the, uh, the, impl the implementation of a table for you. And also, um, we have two other annotations which actually trigger uh, the um, AST transformations. We have a type-checked transformation, which does ty uh, static type-checking of your code. So it provides the same kind of uh, feedback as the Java C compiler if you make typos, if you use uh, wrong return types, and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty advanced because it does type inference. You can still write idiomatic groovy code, but you just annotate it with add type checked, and it's going to be type checked. Uh, but if you use type check, you cannot use certain of the dynamic features like builders, etc. So it's a trade-off. Um, <clears throat> and we also have add compile static, with that, which does static compilation just like Java C instead of going into the groovy runtime uh, for the, the multiple dispatch. And, well, you can go beyond because you can extend the type checker to, uh, 
to, to type check things like dynamic DSLs and so on. So you could have statically typed builders, but it's a bit more work. And what's interesting is that with uh, compiled static, you generate the same, more or less the same bytecode as Java C, and you also get the same performance. So this table, um, well, I haven't updated it recently. I ran that a, a while ago on Java 6 with Groovy 2. Dot or something. Uh, we're going to release, we released 2.1 six months ago, and 2.2 is going to be released in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the figures you see here should even be better now, especially the, on the 2.x li uh, line. But, you know, historically, Groovy for certain, for, for those micro benchmarks, uh, they, they used to exhibit the worst possible performance for Groovy uh, because of recursion, because of um, things like boxing and unboxing, and for many reasons, those micro benchmarks were showing Groovy in really bad lights. But in Groovy 1.8, we, we added some optimizations from, for primitive type calculations, and then uh, we continue regularly improving, obviously, the performance of Groovy itself uh, beyond that. And then with static compilation, uh, you can see that uh, Except for that one, but I'd have to check with the latest Groovy to see if it's now as fast as Java or not. But it's pretty much the same speed as Java, okay? Sometimes there may be a small overhead, but more or less, uh, you know, five or ten percent slower at times, but you can have Groovy code as fast as Java as needed. And I'll finish with a few words about the, the community, because Groovy is not just the language, it's not just the APIs. Um, and all those shortcuts and uh, nice features that I showed you. But it's also a blossoming ecosystem because there's not just Groovy. There's Rails, the uh, web, uh, full-blown web framework, full-stack um, full web framework. You also uh, have Gryphon, which is a rich desktop uh, framework, a bit like Rails. It's spawned from Rails, uh, but for rich desktop applications. You have Gradle, uh, which, is a, which is really becoming a very, very popular build automation solution uh, to replace Maven or Ant. And you have tons of other nice projects. And I'm going to tell you if, about some of these. So the, the, the new kid on the block. So that's the new kid on, on the block, if you remember them <coughs> from the 80s. When was that? Or beginning of 90s? I don't remember. Well, anyway. Uh, GVM, the Groovy Environment Manager, that's a command line tool where uh, once you've installed it, you say uh, GVM install Groovy, it's going to install the latest Groovy version. You can say uh, GVM install uh, Gradle 1.9 RC2, which is the last version of Gradle, etc., or Spring Boot. You can say up uh, uh, um, GVM install uh, Spring Boot, and it's going to install the latest version of Spring Boot on your environment. That's pretty handy, uh, especially for me, Groovy developer, when I want to test things between different versions of Groovy, I'm happy to have that tool to be able to go back in time somehow and use uh, a different version of Groovy or Grails, etc. That's pretty handy. Or if you work with different projects with different versions, that can be useful. Spock, uh, there was a an awesome presentation by Ken Seip uh, just before that talk about Spock, uh, where he showed all the advanced features of uh, Spock. So Spock is a testing framework, an enterprise <coughs> testing framework. Um, that's, uh, I think, the same example I showed in the uh, introduction. What I like about Spock is how expressive and readable it is. So you have assert statements there. You don't, you, you don't even use, actually, the assert keyword, you just say math, max, A, B, and C, and you use a, a wiki-like notation uh, yeah, here <laughs> uh, for data-driven tests. And you can also use a, an annotation called at unroll if you want to have a, a different met, a test, uh, well, test, uh, method tests for the different values so that uh, it shows in the uh, JUnit reports or in your ID test runner so, so that you see one run for each uh, value, set of values. And, uh, you know, you use A and B and C. The, those variables haven't been defined, but they are actually defined there in the uh, well block. So that's pretty expressive. And I like the, you know, the wiki-like notation for that uh, data table. Another example, there's a cool little framework that can be uh, used uh, 
Well, for I would probably say for our small apps, not necessarily for big apps, uh, called Rat Pack. Um, and by the way, I didn't tell you about add grab. Uh, you put that into a Groovy script, and you just run the Groovy command, and it's going to fetch the dependencies for your project. So even in the, pre uh, in the, the previous example, uh, I didn't have to set up a build file or anything to retrieve my dependencies. I just used add grab, and it's grabbing the dependencies. It's built as, a, as an AST transformation, and it's, fe and it's fetching the dependencies. Uh, yeah, so this is a, well, a nice little uh, web framework that can be used for testing, for example, if you want to quickly set up tests, uh, like, uh, you know, REST services that you want to mock or something like that. That's, pretty, that, that's a, a, good, a good solution for uh, writing such mock uh, services. It's based on Netty. And one last example. Um, so I wanted to show you the, some of the projects with, which are not necessarily as well known as things like Gradle, Grails, etc., or, or even Spark, which is quite well known in the community. Jeb, uh, which is a browser automation solution and also often used for testing, integration testing in particular. Uh, it can work with Firefox, Chrome, or HTML units. So you say a browser, browser drive. So I forgot to use the, the grab statement here. Uh, it, depending on the dependency you fetch, uh, it's going to uh, fetch uh, the Chrome variant, the Firefox variant, or the HTML unit variant. So you can say browser drive. So you're going to drive your browser. Go to that page. Assert, notice the, um, the, the jQuery, um, you know, jQuery-like notation. Assert that the text of the H1 title is please log in. Then with that form that you find in the resulting page, uh, set up the values, username, password, the fields of that form, fill in the, field, the, fill in the, the form for me, and then uh, click on the login, I think that's the login uh, button, I think, uh, the submit button, and then you call click. And then again, you can assert that, okay, you went into the admin section. And if you mix that with Spock, you can have, uh, so it's perhaps a bit small for the back of the room. I don't know if it's readable enough. You can do BDD style, behavior driven development style uh, test. Given you're going to the Google home page, you expect to be at the Google home page. When you put uh, Wikipedia in the search field, then you wait for uh, going to the Google results page, etc. cetera. Um, here, I, I, I haven't defined Google home page, et cetera, but that's, um, there's a notion of page objects uh, in Jeb uh, to simplify testing, and also to hide things like URLs or particular uh, CSS, uh, you know, qualifiers to find the the right element in the in, uh, dumb uh, dumb path, basically. With page objects, uh, given when then, etc., and you have wait for uh, for slow loading pages. You wait for being at the right page, etc. So it's a pretty nice. Uh, library if you want to do integration testing in your applications for your web applications. So in summary, Groove is, is Java's best friend, derived from Java, so it has got a flat learning curve, but it goes beyond Java in terms of conciseness, expressiveness, as well as all the, the nice APIs that it provides, or wrappers around uh, JDK APIs. Uh, I hope I also sh managed to show you how uh, it's a great fit for domain-specific languages to write readable business rules. And also you can really mix and match Groovy and Java together. You may have a Java interface implemented in Groovy, then you extend that Groovy class in Java, etc. You can have you know, circular dependencies between the languages. And we have a joint compiler to do that joint compilation, and also Compared to other languages, uh, what's nice is that there's no language barrier between the two. So you don't have to convert a Groovy object into a Java object, because a Groovy object is just a Java object. So it's totally transparent. And although the, the nature of Groovy is to be an object-oriented and dynamic language, it can be as type-safe as a statically typed language. It can be as fast as, to, as a statically compiled language, and it provides lots of primitives for uh, following the functional programming style. And to finish uh, the use cases, it's great for um, scripting tasks, for build automation, uh, 
for uh, extension points uh, in uh, configuring your apps and projects, etc. For example, GUI is used in uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, there are a few uh, companies using Groovy to script uh, you know, the, the various elements of your uh, IoT mesh. Great for domain-specific languages and as, as well, of course, great for full-blown apps like uh, desktop apps with Gryphon, web apps with Grails, Redpack, etc., or also with the, the latest project uh, here at uh, Pivotal called Reactor for uh, reactive uh, programming. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm a bit over time, uh, but I'll be happy to answer uh, questions if you have some. Thank you. <laughs>